Welcome to Rebuilding with Shelley Armado, a show dedicated to showcasing strong and resilient leaders and individuals from all walks of life. Join us as we explore inspiring stories from all around the world. Here's your host, Shelley Armado. Welcome back, it's Shelly Armado, My Smart Plans. I'm the CEO and co-founder. We're radically transforming the construction industry. And so I'm addicted to courage. And uh, so the way I've done everything I've built for the last 15 years is finding women like Elizabeth to hear their stories of courage. And then, I don't know, something radically happens in my life. And then all of a sudden I'm like, well, huh, I can do this. So uh, today we have Elizabeth McCormick, Okay, this is the crazy thing. So when I started uh, with my show, uh, Jeff Coley, he is the CEO of, um, what's the name of the company? I don't remember. Hang on. I think it's on the call. Uh, Real News PR. I mean, P- I don't even know, but he's fabulous. Anyway, he's like, you have to meet Elizabeth. So welcome, Elizabeth. I can't wait to hear your story and um, take it away. Oh my goodness. Um, where shall I start? Shall I just start at the beginning? Yeah. I mean, like, how did you decide to do, to be this helicopter? Like, how did that whole thing happen? So it started out of desperation, kind of. So I was an unemployed military wife with five years of college, three college degrees, and um, an unhappy marriage. So I uh, couldn't get a job. We were stationed at Fort Polk, Louisiana, which in now my speeches, I talk about how, you know, the people who live there call it Fort Puke. So there was no jobs, nothing going on. Uh, I ended up getting a job in a pizza place after five years of college. Wow. Okay. So keep going. This is good. (laughs) I was just miserable. And so, you know, you get to that point where you realize something has to change. Yeah. And and that I think is that, that I love you're addicted to courage because I wasn't, I was kind of, kind of shy. I had grown up really shy and then became, um, you know, went to college and got into sports and kind of got out of myself a little bit, but I still had that little shy girl in me. So courage wasn't something I really thought about or thought about doing, but what I knew is something had to change. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we all get to that kind of that cusp of a decision point where we know something, something has to give and hopefully it's not you, you know, not your mind and your yeah, mind yeah, yeah, yeah. yourself. Yeah. So, um, um, so this is the thing about courage. Um, it, it, I mean, we're born with it, but like life happens to us and then we forget what's possible. You know, like we come out of the, out of the womb, like with the courage to crawl and walk and talk and make mistakes. And if we fall, we get up and then life starts happening and we just keep like hitting the wall, especially in my life too. And I wasn't always full of courage like you, but I mean, out of desperation, I was like, I, I have to do something. And so taking massive action really is what you're talking about. Like I am no longer willing to tolerate this thing. And so uh, up from the ashes, we rise. I mean, the Bible even says that, right? God takes our ashes and makes them beautiful. So keep going. This is, I love this. Keep going. I love it. Well, in, in my in my book, I've got here, the P for the pilot method, the P is about potential. So it got to the point where I knew I had all this college and education and, and things that I could do. And I had all this potential and none of it was getting realized. Uh, working in a pizza place was not my lifelong. I mean, I like food, yeah. but not my lifelong desire and, and future. Um, so I, I looked at the things I could change because you know, no matter what situation you're in, there is something that can change. And for me, I looked at it and said, well, I could change my job. I could go in, you know, if, if my, I call him the starter husband, if the starter husband could be in the military, why couldn't I be in the military? Excellent. Yes. (laughs) And so, so you know, it doesn't look that hard. <laughs> yeah. So did you join? I mean, you just go to the recruiting office and like say I'm joining or what did you do? Yeah. So I decided that I knew with my college, I could go in as an officer. I knew I had more options than the, than the high school graduate that's walking in. Right. So I thought I really should research this. I should do some research. So I went onto the base and uh, asked any officer I could find anywhere. I, I would like, 
Burger King at lunch because that was the only restaurant they used to have on the basis was Burger King. I would yeah. sit at Burger King at lunch and and at breakfast time and I would look for someone with an officer uniform on and I was like, can I ask you some questions? And I asked them what what would they do if they had to do it over again? And what would they do differently? And the probably the most important question I asked was, what's the coolest job? <laughs> Excellent. And yeah. so I, I, I was on a quest. I, I, I wanted to know. I was so curious and I had no idea. I didn't go in with, I think I'm going to do this. I had never considered that I would be a pilot. I had never thought about aviation or anything else. I, I just had like no preconceived notions. I was open to the possibilities. And yeah. I think that's, that's part of that. Yeah. Is, well, the curiosity is, is the key. I mean, to courage, finding your curiosity to overcome fear is the key to all majesty, like adopting. So I, I do this thing called the Courage Coalition. It's a whole other story. But anyway, I bring in women who are willing to share their stories because, you know, a lot of women are trying to be like, I am so perfect. Hello. You know, I am so perfect. And then they start tearing down or tearing off their mask and realizing that they've created this facade for themselves to keep themselves in this illusion. And so I start talking about adopting, like adopt curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. Adopt integrity. I was reading today about uh, the uh, percentage of highly successful people that put their grocery cart back at the store. I... I I can't leave the store unless my grocery cart's back. You know what I'm do. saying? Like, I bet there's all these characteristics if somebody really went in with forensically and started looking at what we've done. And I bet there's curious, I bet there's like these characteristics that you could just adopt and take massive action. But that's excellent. Okay, keep going. I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> so uh, everyone I talked to said being a pilot. I wish I could, I wish I had gone aviation. If I had perfect vision, I'd have been a pilot. Uh, just everywhere I went, it was becoming a pilot. And so I was like, okay, I'll be a pilot. <laughs> Listen, I had no idea it was hard. I had no idea the odds, the obstacles, how difficult it was to get into the program, how few women were talking at a time where less than 1% of all the women were all the pilots were women. So less than one. Yeah. So we're talking 200 to 250 pilots, one woman. Like, no idea. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, said, you didn't okay. need the odds stacked against you. You're just like, okay, well, I'm going to be curious and find out. Fabulous. Okay, well, keep going. Know, I mean, I had all this, co I had all this college, right? Yeah. I had the, I have a degree in art, a minor in mathematics, which if I ever went back to school for another year, I could make a double major, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, in mathematics. And I had an associate's degree in engineering. I was married to a military spouse. I played college volleyball. So I had athleticism and physical fitness in my favor as well. So to me, I had the perfect vision they were looking for. To me, I was like, of course I could do this. Why yeah. couldn't I? Yes. Oh my. Okay. So where was your first flight after you went to the training? Like then what, where did you find yourself in the seat going, okay, hang on. I'm now a pilot. I'm going. It is crazy. Uh, back then, this was pre 9-11. This is uh, the year was actually, um, don't do any math, please. 1994. So back then the it was, it's crazy. It, it, I was put in a program called high school to flight school. And it wasn't about high school, it was about speed. I went through basic training, eight weeks of basic training, so eight. Then I had um, six weeks of Warrant Officer Candidate School. So 14 weeks, maybe a week in between for travel and in processing. So just, so we'll say 15 weeks. And then I started flight school the following Monday. So I was in flight school on my 16th week, four months of being in the military. Within two, two and a half, two months, I think at that time, I think it was within two months, maybe six weeks after that, I was in a helicopter flying. Like they, after 9-11, they're like, we can't do that. <laughs> now they had to go through all this other training and they had to actually go to dunker school and escape an evasion school between candidate school and flight school to make sure that like, they want to make sure before they put you in an airframe. But back then, so you we're talking- did it. Oh my Four gosh. Months. This is, this is, this is the Nike commercial. You just do it, right? Just do it. You just do, just it. do it. But 
Go but here's it. the thing I didn't know, Shelly, is that everyone else was against me. The, the recruiter didn't know how to do the paperwork. I sat in his office, read the regulations, and did the paperwork for him. The flight doctor looked at me and he said, little girl, don't you know flight school's really hard? <laughs> you know? And then uh, for the physical, and I was like, sir, I have an appointment. Let's just take the physical. Yeah. When I went to take my entrance testing, I had to take what they call the flight aptitude skills test. They call it the fast test, by the way. It's really slow. And I took that test and the examiner issuing the test was like, young lady, don't you know it's really hard? I mean, just everywhere I went, no one else believed. Yeah, I have experienced the same thing. When I started my company, I mean, I've, I've been called a used tampon. I mean, my company has been referred to as a used tampon because we're disrupting all of the tall white boys in the industry. And I mean, I had one, one huge client pat me on my shoulder in front of all these men. And he's like, oh, honey, you can't handle all of our business. And I was just like, snap back, like, uh, remove your hand from my shoulder. Okay. Don't touch my <laughs> shoulder. I mean, seriously. Cause I mean, it was also the arm's length of like midsection. <laughs> so touch my shoulder reaction. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I might've gone down instead of up. <laughs> Well, my elbow was right was different, at the different, total. different target there. Sorry, yeah, no, it was it, it would have hit pretty. Yeah, <laughs> hmm. that would have been so fun. I should have I should have reacted like I don't know. But anyway, yeah, I know. <laughs> but we do it anyway, don't we? We just keep moving our feet. You know, I, I get asked a lot by women that are in male dominated industries now, and you know, and they're and they're still. I mean, construction, you yes. know, manufacturing, yeah male dominated industries and they're still struggling yes. and they're still struggling by a lot of that bias, some conscious, some unconscious. And they, you know, when I, when I speak to male and female audiences, you know, I get asked like, what do I do? What should I do? And I just like, you know what you show up and you bring your absolute best every single day. That's right. And I they think can't that take also, that away from you. Yeah. The comma behind that is laying on your back is not the way you're going to get where you're going. You know what I mean? Like women, we have been, um, we've been on our back a lot, frankly. I mean, I mean, past generations, you had to get on your back to get where it was like, that was the favor, the favor card. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And now it's just like, oh dude, I will walk all over you. Excuse me. You are standing still walking around you. And that's what, we, that's what we've had to do because we as women have waited for permission, right? We don't need permission. <laughs> No, you, we already have permission. Let's just declare that right now. We have permission as women to go and change the world. Well, and I like to say, um, I'm going to walk, take my high heels and walk on your back to get where, I, you know, so. I love you know, that. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, men have hats as women. I, I, you know, I have a fondness for shoes. Not so much the last uh, couple of years with the pandemic, but. Yes, uh, I know. And we don't have to wear stilettos either. We can just wear, I mean, I have these red tennis shoes I wear most everywhere. And if I have a really important meeting, I'll put on something else. But I love my red <laughs> tennis shoes because, I mean, I got to get where I'm going and I'm not going to be in pain. So just get out of the way. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I have a nice chunky heel. I like a nice chunky heel on my shoes. But Okay. Well, that works. More, whatever you're more, comfortable. More stable. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what are you doing now after all of that resume? Where did it land you now? So I did almost eight years in the military and uh, stationed at, uh, did training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, Fort Rucker, Alabama is where flight school is. We call it Fort Rucker, Mother Rucker, because you always go home to mother for aviation. Uh, went to Fort Drum, New York, did two and a half years at the 10th Mountain Division, pr a pretty tough assignment. And then after that, got to Germany. And then while I was in Germany, I supported Kosovo peacekeeping operations and flew back and forth from Germany while my unit, the rest of my unit was in Kosovo. And then I was injured. Uh, from it shouldn't have happened, completely preventable, negligent medical care, and lost my flight career. And they spent about a year trying to fix me, so I didn't fly for that year. And when you don't fly, you have to have a job. So my job was in logisti logistics, inventory, procurement, contract negotiation, which gave me a s more than a year because I did that part-time while I was flying as well. But then I switched roles with someone who had it as a full-time job uh, while they were trying to fix me. 
and uh, got a job right away when I got out of the military. So I worked in corporate for eight years. Oh my, okay. And what oh, in was manufacturing. Manufacturing. <laughs> okay. In You're warehousing, like in procurement, in contract. And my last job, I was the international contract negotiator specializing for manufacturing, specializing in international markets. I mean, your resume. Oh, okay. So as a little girl, <laughs> what was, what was your imaginary play? You know what I'm saying? Like I was a school teacher and I had imaginary students. What was your imaginary play? So I was an arty. I was a very artsy and I would design sketch and design jewelry was my, was my fun play. And then I thought I like to argue. So maybe I'll be a lawyer. So I would be the lawyer and like to argue and stand up for people that had been, um, you know, unjustly accused. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then, um, and then my high school college goal was to be an architect and combine the math and the art and, um, kind of mix it all up and go into architecture. So I started designing and sketching buildings. So I had this creative creativity and I had this logic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it kind of sometimes was at a struggle and a war with each other, uh, and, until I could figure out how to harness what I need when I needed it. I mean, brilliant. Okay. Have you ever done the wealth dynamics test? I haven't done that one. Okay, well, Google it after we get off. It's $97. It would be so intriguing to see where your wealth dynamics land. Um, but uh, it, it just shows like I'm a total creator. So I'm up here always creating and implementing. And then there's all of these other skills that I don't, that I haven't mastered that I have to fill my life with these things in order for the creator to fulfill and implement that. You know what I'm saying? But it's, it's so intriguing to me. I, I, first of all, amazing your story. I mean, like amazing, you crushed it. And then secondly, going back and encouraging other women to say, Hey baby, I see you. I'm not going to do really well if you decide that you're powerless. Cause that's not going to work for me. Uh, but if you choose to get on the train of possibilities, like let's go. Cause that's what you're saying. The train of possibilities, right? Yep. Even if it's I a pizza it, shop, go. Yeah. I call it being in the potential zone. Yeah. Yeah. Because in our, in our comfort zone, we get what we already got. Cause we're going where we've already been. Mm, so true. So true. The familiar will kill us. Oh my gosh. Yes. It's com and it, But it's comfortable and so many people stay in it. And I call that being like, there's so many people who live their life on autopilot. Yeah. Yeah. And they do the same things in the same way in the same day. That's what mom did. That's what, yeah. you know, yeah. grandma did. That's what, yeah. you know, that's what my sister does. I've lived in the same town my whole life and they don't take a risk. Yeah. They well, and also they, new things. you find other people that are in that same place to keep you in that same place. You know what I mean? Because it's like their complaint is your complaint. And then your friendship is then based on um, this familiar zone. So if you try to leave that relationship, that friendship is like, well, you know, I really don't want you to leave because what's that say about me? So it's like learning to soar. And that's, that's the key to life, right? Just soar. I mean, like, let's go. Let's, let's go change the world. And that's what you've done. Thank you. First of all. Okay. So what's your day look like now? What do you, what's your, what, uh, what do you, let's what, see. I've written, um, so I started speaking, uh, in, I, well, I started speaking part-time while I was working on a corporate job and I was with involved with a network marketing company at that time. And, um, even though I was working a full-time job became very successful and a role model in that company. And they were like, what are you doing? So they invited me to come speak at their conferences, um, instead of being in the audience. And I was like, Oh, well, that's pretty cool. Uh, I'll never forget the first time I got one of those speeches, my mother was in the audience and she was like front row right there and cried and sobbed. I couldn't look at her. Like I was, like, I couldn't look at her. And I was like, what were you doing afterwards? She almost made me cry. And she's like, you grew up so shy. And, uh, what I, what I figured out is I, 
it felt so natural for me to be on stage and I knew how to move and I knew like how to react. And I, and because I had that pilot experience, I could see everything. Like I had this hyper awareness yeah. of the audience and yeah. what was going on. And, and, uh, it, it just became a very, it was a very powerful epiphany for me that maybe I could do this. Yeah. It's where you belong. Right. I mean, you were being set up to set out. That's what I always talk about in the little, even working at the pizza place you're working at, you were being set up to set out for something, something you got experience with at the pizza place, whether it was the, uh, the sheer, like, I'm not staying here. Right. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe that was it, but something from that place said, okay, now I'm going to take this and I'm going to go here and I'm going to go here and I'm going to go here and then I'm going to go here. And then I'm going to land here and look back and go, Oh, mm -hmm. here it is. Yeah. Here's what if I, what if we hadn't had that adversity? Right. What if we hadn't gone through the struggle? Like for me uh, now I'm motiv you know, motivational speaker before the pandemic, I was doing about 110 conventions, conferences, associations, schools, you know, colleges, events a year, 110. But what would I be talking about? Yeah. How would I be helping people now? Yeah. If I hadn't gone through all the struggle then. Yeah. Well, it's the hand out instead of, uh, wait a minute, it's a hand up instead of a hand out. But you're saying, well, here's my hand, but you have to rise up in order to find your hand, right? Because mm -hmm. it's what it's all about. I mean, it is what it's all about. It is, it is the world of possibilities. But I say the world of probabilities is not many people are willing to do the uncomfortable thing. You know what I'm saying? Because it's definitely, yeah. it's not comfortable. Is it comfortable? Oh no, oh, it's no. not, <laughs> it's not comfortable. Like going into the recruiting station and, and him saying you could, you could be a cook and, and me saying, no, like yeah. that wasn't comfortable. Yeah. Having a flight instructor who didn't believe women should fly and tried to fail me every day in the very first phase and screaming at me yeah. like that wasn't comfortable. No. Uh, you know, having, while I was at my first duty assignment at Fort Drum, New York, I was, I was stalked and physically abused by another pilot and have 57 pages of police reports. That wasn't comfortable. I thought I was going to die yeah. any day could have died from that. Yeah. And the guy, yeah. you know, ended up in Germany and then I, you know, and finally succeeding and doing well and things are going good and I get injured. And I'm like, really? Like, really? Is, is this what I'm it really, you know, and now then after working eight years in corporate America and different companies and roles, you know, when I started speaking, I looked back and went, wow, what a gift I'd been given yeah. with yeah. those struggles. Yeah. Like it was truly a gift Yeah, that I learned from and I grew from and I, 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 I now have those experiences for others yes. and, and this is what I'm meant to do. Yeah. I always, um, people ask me like, well, I mean, do you pray? And I go, this is how I pray. Lord, pick me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, pick me. What, what is it that you just pick me? It's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I mean, because I know anything that he sets me up to do, he's already there with me. And I'm not, I, I always say whatever he says, I say, cause I don't even know what he says. I can read his word, but it's like, I, I, I don't even know. Seriously, Lord, just whatever you say, I say, cause I mean, if I'm speaking it, I'm sure it's wrong. You know what I'm saying? But it's mm -hmm. just like my whole life looking back and being willing to be kind. And, and I, I don't know. I, it's where I live. I, I love, I love giving, I love giving a smile. I love the possibilities because that transforms everything I'm doing here. Right. Yeah. Taking the cart back transforms everything I'm doing here. I mean, making like our hotel here, I cleaned the hotel before the cleaning lady's coming because when she walks in, she's not going to feel like, Oh God, a, a pig was here. No, she's going to be like, who takes out the trash of their hotel room? I do. Because if I was if I was doing that job, I would really appreciate someone not leaving me a mess. So that's what it's about. It's like so, there's so many clues, right? Oh my gosh. Well, I want to thank you. Go. No, what? What else? How, what? How you do the little things? Yes. Is how you do everything. That's exactly a hundred percent. Eight hundred percent. It. Yeah. Okay. So let's go change the world. Let's stay in touch. Because I'm. I, I mean, I'm getting your book. I cannot wait to read your book. And I, 
I, I'm honored. I, I feel really weird sitting here talking to you because I feel like you served our country and I want to stand up and salute you, but I don't know really how to do the salute thing. So I'm doing that in my mind. <laughs> it's okay. It's probably better you don't. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, anyway, so thank you for your service. Thank you for your courage. And thank you for your willingness to go out and tell the world it wasn't perfect. It, it wasn't easy, but I did it anyway. Okay. How do people find you? Like, tell, tell your contact. Yeah. So I'm, let's see over here, pilot speaker on everything, everything pilot speaker, you search pilot speaker on any, any social media channel. It's on my website. It's everything pilot speaker.com pilot speaker is my handle pilot speaker on Insta pilot speaker on Twitter pilot speaker on you name it. <laughs> Facebook. Okay. So I'm going to be finding you there. I'll send you a my connection. Books, my book's the pilot method. And, um, that's, you can, if you go directly to pilotmethod.com, I'll send you a signed autographed copy versus buying it on, on another distri distribution channel. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Have a fabulous day. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Just like Jeff said, I would love you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Jeff's usually right. Jeff yes. is good. <laughs> yes. He's very much right. Have a great day. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching this week's episode. Brought to you by My Smart Plans and Courage Coalition. For more information about our guest or other links, please see the description below. We'll see you next week on Rebuilding with Shelley Armato.